Thank you for auditing the Always Positive New Music Review Show, where a French professor reviews new music, usually. But, you know, it's been a long year. It's December. Usually towards December, January, releases slow down a little bit. And I need to catch up on some albums I missed. So I'm going to be continuing something I did last year, uh, Albums I Missed. Uh, I've changed it to Potential Albums of the Year I Missed, 2023. So, yeah, I fixed it. I, I, uh, I went to my entire uh, design team <laughs> and we came up with this. So I'm going to be talking about the album Hell Mode uh, or Hell Mode D by Jeff Rosenstock. And, uh, you know, I had a totally boring review ready for this. <laughs> Maybe it's still going to be boring. Who knows? It's all subjective, uh, as is all music critics. Um, but, you know, I had a, like a fairly standard review of it where I, you know, I was going to talk about it. It's a very cohesive album. I was fascinated by the fact that it's the cover you see in the back of the Black Midi album, uh, Hellfire, the Hellfire, Hell Mode, kind of diagonal pink lines with kind of weird gothic y fonts. Like it, it felt like maybe there's a similarity there. I thought about going on some kind of extended meditation on the difference between British and American post punk and maybe relationship between, between irony and, and earnestness, or maybe age and youth, you know, because Jeff Rosenstock is in his early 40s and the Black Midi guys are all in their 20s. And I was ready, you know, all the combination of elements that I hear, you know. Elvis Costello and Weezer and all that stuff, and that would have been a fine review. And you'll you'll hear little bits of that creep in here. Uh, but then there's the true strength of the album, which defies sort of simple explanation, and that is the emotional punch that this album can give you. So I listened to it all the way through yesterday, took notes, everything it was great. And then I went this morning, and there was one song. Okay, so there I am. I'm at the YMCA. And I'm on the elliptical. And uh, I was watching Brighton frustratingly get shellacked by Chelsea. And, and I, I'm listening to one song in particular on this album. And I'm not going to tell you what song it is yet. That, that'll be a little surprise for you. And I just start bawling. I mean, like, I just met former President Trump. Tears pouring down my face. I'm just Fortunately, this channel started uh, at the gym, right? Because I... I, I I used to record this, and it used to be called Sweaty Record Review because I was insecure about my sweating. But like, you know, so there, fortunately I'm sweating. So when you sweat a lot, no one can tell you're crying. But I'm just there in public, and the emotional strength of the album overwhelms me. And I realize, you know, I talked about Quantic uh, uh, last week, you know, an 18-year-old singer, and they are very capable of making you have those emotional feelings. And it's a reminder of the power of loud guitar music. <laughs> The power of punk and post-punk and pre-punk and proto-punk and all that stuff to help give people some sort of emotional outlet of all these kind of pent-up feelings. So that's really where I want to start the review from. An album that made me cry like a little baby on an elliptical this morning, okay? That, that's why. <laughs> like, that's the real strength of the album. And that must be why so many people wanted me to review this. You know, I put out a, I put out a poll and hundreds of people voted for this. And I, I happened to just sort of out this corner of my eye, I saw that it got a, a yellow flannel from Fantano. So I thought maybe it's, maybe it's just that everyone, you know, likes it when I talk about stuff that Fantano talks about. I don't know. Uh, but no, I think what it is, is people, and this is my prediction, tell me if I'm right in the comments, People form a connection to this album, a very strong emotional bond. It is a great post-COVID album. It is also a very good of-the-moment album, an album describing the difficulties that we have in our culture in post what I call COVID 2016, uh, the world that we've been living in since 2016, this feeling of division and pain and anger and hopelessness and impending doom, uh, which exhibits itself in all sorts of different ways. This is an album which defines and describes that I think as well as any album I've listened to in the five years I've been doing this channel. So that's a lot more interesting, I think, than some kind of extended discourse about, about post-punk in England versus post-punk in America, because that would have been lame anyways. So if you like this video, subscribe, uh, smash the like bucket. Um, I, I'm sponsored today uh, by just love yourself, would you? Just seriously. Uh, tell me, right now, when, just say something good you did this week. I don't care if it's as simple as, you know, fed your fish, okay? Just say something good. You know, love yourself. It's hard. The, the world is, it's a lot easier to make money off of you when you feel bad about yourself. So, 
That's my sponsorship today. Uh, if you like if you like this video and, and you want to show me that, you want to help the channel, I have a little secret code, AVAA. It stands for awesome video as always. You put that in the comments and I will go and I will heart that. Okay? It's just a little fun thing I do here. So I'm not going to tell you the stamp. I usually do a stamp, like my example song, the best track off the album, but I want to save that till I get to the song that made me cry. <laughs> okay? Let's just start at the beginning. The thing about this album, sort of from that more... So well, I'll just do that. It's the, it's the head and the heart, right? So the head part of me likes this album a good deal and thinks it's a very solid punk, post-punk album. And I don't know Jeff Rosenstock at all, okay? I don't know. I've never heard a single second of any of his music ever, okay? So this is my absolute introduction to, to, to anything he's ever done, okay? I don't know if he's playing with the same band he's played forever. I don't know if he was in... Uh, a ska band or a reggae band or a industrial grindcore band. I don't know if he's always been a soul. I don't know if he was like the lead singer of like some band that I haven't listened to. <laughs> you know, I have no idea. So I'm just coming to it just raw right here with this guy who I just, I looked up to see his age because I thought that did matter. And so when I found out he was in his early 40s, it kind of came together. But you know, it's a really tight, really cohesive album. Tracks lend in one to the other. There's this whole feeling the whole album gives you of a very healing of the moment album. I think that's its greatest its greatest attribute is in the middle of the album, there's a track called uh, Heal Mode. So, or Heal Mode D. Heal Mode. So, Heal Mode and Hell Mode. It just happens to be two sides of the coin. And that the only thing you can do when you live in hell is heal yourself. I think. I think that's the point. So, let's start off with the first track, Will You Still You? Not to be confused with the coach of Reims, Will Still. Uh, what I like about this is it's very Elvis Costello style, at least in the beginning here. Like the bass, guitar, and drums, very sweet chords. But then there's, you know, modern aspects of the of the kind of blown out voice here. But it reminded me of Elvis Costello. It reminded me also of They Might Be Giants. You know, who are a punk band? <laughs> you know, I understand that they're nerds, but they're also a punk band. Uh, but what's great about this song as an introduction is it really just lays it out for you. What is this album going to be? It's going to be a lot of different styles. So we kind of start off with this sort of pre-punk, post-punk thing, and then we get just full punk with this upbeat bit where the drums are struggling to catch up. And then this beautiful this instrumental moment with like bells and all the music is very precise and it feels like it's trying to call back to pet sounds or something kind of Beach Boysy. And then it goes to like a... A, what I thought was going to be the full anthemic bit. So when I say anthemic, I mean the kind of music that makes you want to be in an arena and sing along with it. Kind of a bratty pop punk sing along. But that was only half anthemic. At the end, it goes full anthemic and just really belts out with everybody singing in the background and makes you feel this whole sense of this whole song, which is a simple song about destroying a relationship. Took you for granted and you fell out of love. I think we can all relate to that. I think we have all been taken for granted or taken someone for granted and fallen out of love. And then at the end of this repetition of fell out of love, fell out of love, there's like a little bit, just a little hint of kind of a Sex pistols -y outro, just like that. Just this kind of like brattiness to it, which I really like because it's a very mature album with often very bratty singing. And that's a, that's a nice combination there. So just already, you see all the different people who I referenced there? Next track is called Heard. Uh, it sounds like a fast drum machine. It's probably not. It's probably just a drummer playing. And he's just screaming. It's like screaming. It's not rap or anything, but he's basically just rhythmically saying words very quickly. A great kind of post-punk chorus. Very political. This album does a very good job of going between the political and the personal. Uh, it's a nice balance of it. In particular, I think it emphasizes the way. And this is a... I think this is a, 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 a now problem. The way that the political completely interrupts the personal. And I'm, you know what, screw it. You, you watch me, right? You don't need me to be prolix. You don't need me to be succinct. Wait, does prolix mean, mean long-winded or short-winded? I don't remember. <laughs> I just used the big grad school word and I forget what it means. That's fine. Um, uh, my, my trademark is stupidity. So the, the thing about this idea of the, the political problems impeding the... Like, think, think of Israel and Palestine. Oh, shit. Think of Israel and Palestine. I'm not going to make any kind of political statement, but I'll tell you, 
um, that it's really affecting young people. Like it's really affecting them. You know, uh, my son goes to college in DC and like the, the entire student body is completely split and just gnashing each other's teeth and tearing each other apart like some kind of horrible painting. Like it's just this just anger and frust. And I understand, you know, I, I, both sides, it's understandable why any side would feel this visceral pain and anger about what's happening 3,000 miles away. But it wasn't always like that. It wasn't. When, when I was in my 20s, or even whatever, even like the Iraq war, the biggest sort of cause of division when I was younger, it didn't have the same feeling. Like you felt bad for what was happening, but it wasn't this kind of division where the things that were happening up top, and it's, obviously it's all social media, it's like you feel important, you feel like you're in the war, but I have news for you, you're not in Gaza. I'm not in Gaza. None of us are in Gaza, okay? None of us are there. None of us are in Israel. None of us are there, but we... It's easier to sell clicks if we feel like our passion for either side of that means something. And of course, it means virtually nothing. Not nothing, virtually nothing. So, with all that said, this album... And I'm riffing here, but I, I, think, it's, I think it's holding up. This album does a great job of by constantly pairing personal despair and political despair of showing how that sense of, glo of macro dread can lead to micro depression. Uh, fears of global warming can lead you personally to feel bad. Like what the hell's wrong with you? Why are you upset? <laughs> I mean, I understand you're upset for the world, but like, it shouldn't stop you from petting your dog or feeding your fish. Anyways. <laughs> Uh, you know, these lyrics, currently it's obvious there's no fair elections, there's no constitution, there's no bell of rights, and you gather in the streets to demonstrate objections, they beat you with a club, whisk you off into the night. Kind of a political statement there. But then it goes to that, in, that personal side, because there's a bomb inside my head and I wish I could disconnect the threads. You know what, I'm too curious. Now, I've got my dictionary of etymology. People always ask me, what's the most important book you have, Sky? The most important book you can have is a dictionary of etymology. It's always useful to find out where words come from. So which does prolix mean? Because now it's just bugging me. And let's see, and where does it come from? P-R-O... Prolix, lengthy, that's what I thought. Lengthy, long-winded, wordy. Uh, it comes from Middle French, prolix, directly from the Latin prolixus, literally poured out. Oh, that's cool. Related to li uh, liquide, liquid, to be fluid. There you go. I was being prolix in defining prolix for you. If you like this video especially a lot, do, oh, just write prolix in the comment, okay? Just, oh, do that, and I'll be super psyched. <laughs> um, I, you know, I like this song, too, because it just kind of ends, and you're like, what? <laughs> oh, it's over? And the album has a great flow. Liked You Better. He appears to go to the uh, Prince School of only using the letter U to say you. This is where the album takes a little bit of a turn. It goes a little bit more towards pop punk, a little bit less... T the thing about punk, right, is the worst kind of punk is punk punk. Right? The, in my opinion, the best kind of punk is proto-punk, and then post-punk, and then modern post-punk, and then at the bottom of the punk list. Well, actually, no. The bottom of the punk list is, is, is pop-punk. But pretty low down is, like, just punk-punk music, right? Um, and so this feels a little bit more like trying to be sort of in that pop-punk zone, which is something I never quite attached myself to. I mean, I remember when Green Day came up and when they were super big, and I, 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 didn't, I didn't get it. Uh, but it's done so well here. There's acoustic guitar, an electric lead line, great melody writing on the, on the guitar, especially electric guitar, full like pop punk verse, cool funky drums. I liked you better when you weren't on my mind. Maybe it's a connection to the first song, the, the, kind, of, the kind of love sick nature of the first track. A very, I call them Cobain solos. Those are guitar solos where you're just playing the melody on guitar in a single string. That was the main thing he did. He wasn't the only person to do it, but he really popularized it. And then it's repeated with a keyboard playing the same thing. The album really does emphasize catchiness, despite the fact that this interesting study on the nature of, uh, of the modern condition and how it can pertain to uh, personal pain. It's also just a very catchy album filled with what the kids these days call bops. 
Uh, at the end, there's an oi, oi, oi sound. And I this put me down a, down a rabbit hole because I've been told since I was like 15. You know, I used to go to punk shows, right? I used to go to Sam Black Church and, and uh, was sick of it all and uh, slap shot. You know, I used to go to like the Channel and the Rathskeller in Boston and go to real punk shows, you know? But I was always told that if someone ever said oi, they're skinheads and they're bad and they're racists. Now, I looked it up this morning. Turns out that's not entirely true. Turns out there's a small portion of people who made music that's called oi who took over the entire movement. So oi is just a general sort of statement of resistance to long, fancy words, like prolix, uh, towards words that, uh, I guess, based on the principle that in our current society, we are being sort of formed and trained into little good worker bees who are able to create complicated ideas to make better tools in order to be tools for some kind of capitalist system. And if you just reduce everything down to one syllable, oi, 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 you get to the simplicity of life, right? Just the simplicity of just energy and music and love and art. So I think that's where he's coming from. And then, did you guess it? We got, we got to this, the, the crying song, Doubt. Okay, so the beginning. It reminds me a lot of Echo and the Bunnymen, speaking of great post-punk bands. And the thing is this, like, I think if I was 17 or 18, I'd be like, oh, L, <laughs> song's not it, chief. I would totally not like this song. I, would, I was not emotionally equipped to handle this song when I was younger. You know, and that's the, that's the thing. You don't learn until you're older that the only strength comes from weakness, right? Understanding your weaknesses and accepting them, right? The only, no, there's no such thing as a strong person who doesn't cry, right? A person who doesn't cry is like the weakest kind of person, right? Just good, good Lord. It, that becomes clear as you get older and as you get stronger, hopefully. A lot of people just get weaker. So this song is so unbelievably earnest. Speak even if it feels weird, even if it feels weird to be yourself, even if your brain begins to melt. It's just a song about self-empowerment. But it's more than that. It's describing the pain of doubting yourself and of feeling that you don't have anything to say. And, you know, I listen to a lot of great sort of anthems. You know, I listen to, you know, a lot of, a lot of great sort of like You Go Girl anthems on, on song, you know, albums made by divas and all that. And I really love it and I really appreciate it. <laughs> but, but it, I don't always relate to it because often it's sort of thrive in spite of what society is doing to you. Uh, whereas this song is thrive in spite of what your own mind is doing to you. Now, perhaps that's coming from a place of privilege because I'm lucky enough to not have society to conspire against me. It's just my own stupid brain. Uh, but still, this really, really touched me. And it more than touched me. It made me think about people who I'm close to in my life who are suffering. And what makes this song so great the way it's set up is there's no chorus, really. There's just three verses. But the back half of the chorus is this like, of the verse, it's like this, uh, this release, slow motion breakdown, you know, just this like sense, like it's kind of building up and then it goes off. And it's really the third verse, that's what got me. The third verse is what got me. That's what got me to cry like no song since Sommeil by Stromae because there are people in my life who I have seen go through this, who have been depressed and who feel like when the day stops short and the sun goes down on you and you didn't get done anything you wanted to, it'd be one thing if it's once or twice, but it's every night of your entire life. I have known too many people who feel that way, and I have felt that way for too long in my life for this song not to just absolutely kill me. And then he goes one step further. The redundancy of your POV. Infinite serotonin starving fever dream. So talking about the nature of serotonin and the without having reuptake inhibitors, some kind of medication to help you feel better. Slow motion kill screen. So this is where it really got me because he's actually really, he's really talking, he's really talking to young men, okay? He's talking, I think, in particular to young men. I don't think it's exclusively to young men, but I think he's talking to a specific kind of young man who's probably pretty similar to the kind of young man who watches this channel and who watches a lot of YouTube and who's listening to this music. 
not exclusively, okay? Feel free to tell me that I'm wrong and how it, how it, how it, but really the expectations of young men to be productive and to make money and to have a career and to have achievement and to have a grind set. And so he's integrating these video game terms like POV, which is often seen as a video game term, it just means point of view. But I think in this case, he's talking about a heads up point of view. And then a slow motion kill screen in a lot of video games, when you die, it goes into slow motion. So he's writing this for the person who doesn't do all of the work that they're supposed to do. And instead of doing that, they just self-medicate with video games with PlayStation or whatever. And it, it just, it really, it really connects to me. And it helps me to feel like, <laughs> like he's doing not God's work, because maybe you don't think God exists, but he's doing humanity's work because the only way to get out of wasting your days and feeling like you're a piece of shit is to accept that you feel like a piece of shit. Like that's the first thing you have to do. You have to say, oh, whoa, I am not a fan of me right now. And then you take sympathy on yourself and then you figure out how to hopefully see some kind of therapy and you figure out how you're coping mechanisms and what you're coping for. And then eventually, once you have learned to accept yourself and love yourself enough to forgive yourself for not being the version of yourself that you couldn't possibly be, that you had no chance of being given your circumstances, you can then let go and start to grow and become the kind of person that you would like to be and would be more edifying for you to be. Whether or not that's productive or not, maybe at the end of it, you're still just playing video games. That doesn't matter. What matters is that you learn how to love yourself. So you think I wasn't crying? <laughs> that's why I was crying. It's, it's too much. It's too much. Kind of a weak bridge on here. But still, then we get to the outro, and I, I couldn't make out all the lyrics. Something about dog shit. I don't know what it was. But, but the real thing is this term. you got to chill out with the doubt. <laughs> Hi, I'm Troy McClure. You may remember me from <laughs> such fundraisers as Out With Gout in 88. you got to chill out with the, with, the, with the doubt. What a stupid lyric. Stupid. Simple rhymes. Chill out. Dude, you're in your 40s. Don't say chill out. This lyric is lame. No, it's not. It's perfect. It's a perfect lyric. It is a absolute arrow through the damn bullseye of a lyric because it's speaking to people who would feel this way. And people who would feel this way are not thinking in terms of prolix. <laughs> okay. Uh, they are thinking in terms of chilling out. You have to chill out with the doubt. Like, that's it. That, that, hey, hey. Uh, if, if you're a high school senior and you put that as your uh, senior quote, send it to me and I'll, I'll give you a shout out on this channel, okay? On my, on my Instagram, okay? <laughs> because that's perfect. That's a, that should be the thing that everyone takes away from this album. You gotta chill out with the doubt. Next track is The Future is Dumb. Oh, back to back. You see what he's doing? Personal, political. Personal, political, okay? Little little one-two combo, okay? Little stick and move, Mac. Little, you should subscribe to Nintendo Power, all right? He's really working here. Per, this is like pop punk perfection. This is totally the feeling of now, and I believe it's in conversation with the Sex Pistols, with the song No Future. That was the feeling for a lot of Generation X kids and sort of late, uh, late age, not really Generation X kids, you know, that there is no future. But what's worse than no future? The future is dumb. That's what's worse than no future. The present is insane. The future is dumb. The past is all mistakes. That's the sense that we have. This is that dread that I'm talking to you about, which can infect the way that you feel. This is the part in the video where I go, oh, did I talk about Israel and Palestine earlier in this video? My comments are going to be all messed up. Um, anyways, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating moment where much like Chill Out With The Doubt, he's using a very simple register of speech. The future is dumb. And he's not saying, uh, it's also very ableist, in, within a decade, this will be just as cringe as if he said the future is R-worded. Just so you know, just a little prediction for you. We're not going to use the word dumb as an insult, but we can for now, so okay. Uh, 
but that's a very silly, it's a very silly thing to say. The future is dumb. It's very silly. But it says everything that we're feeling. And it's worse than no future. <laughs> because dumb is silly. No future is, is heroic. No future is we're living on the end times. We have to fight. <laughs> Next track is Soft Living. Kind of starts off with some feedback, kind of more bratty singing. It actually reminds me a lot of Pavement. Talks about uh, Aaron Carter. Is Aaron Carter like a Nickelodeon star? Or is he the singer who has like a million babies? Right? There's, there's a singer who has like 15 kids and he pays and he like takes good care of them financially and he's in a totally consensual relationship with all of the mothers of his kids and then there's like a blonde headed uh, pop star which one of those is Aaron Carter I don't know anyways he talks about seeing Aaron Carter on Target or probably more like reading a magazine like reading Us magazine and it's like they're just like us and seeing Aaron Carter there well, I always get mixed up with Anson Carter who's a hockey player for the Boston Bruins in the late 90s uh, he's one of my favorite players back then. Um, but, you know, it's, again, about the end of the world. Very, I haven't said Weezer too much on so far, but this this does often feel to me like Weezer for cool kids. Now, I like Weezer. I think Weezer is for cool kids, but I think a lot of cool kids can't allow themselves to accept just how great Weezer is. So this has a lot of that sort of catchy, infectious guitar work, especially the kind of bendy guitar melody in the instrumental bit here. The instrumental bit in the song is one of the highlights of the album. Heel mode is that sort of the conversation. It's a really neat trick because there is no title track to the album. So heel mode is the closest we get. So we have to heal. And this is like the song where he's like singing about the rain in California and taking a one-hitter, which I think is some kind of marijuana ingestion device. Uh, I'm not, not too hip on the lingo with that. Um, but I do love how he talks about listening to the paradiddles on the leaves. That's this little line. So a paradiddle, if you don't know, is a drum exercise. Right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. Uh, if you practice that a lot, you'll get a lot better at drums because it's like a kind of pattern. And, you know, you just it's a, it's a thing you end up doing a lot. Um, but I like it because that's the sense that we sometimes get in nature where we just, like, I don't know if you're like me, but if I look at a tree for even two seconds, I try to find a face in the bark. Like, I just, I can't deal with chaos. I can't, I can't deal with the chaos of nature, so I try to find some kind of meaning, some kind of structure, some kind of form in it that isn't there. Like a, like a paradiddle. I'm always weak on my left hand with paradiddles. My son makes fun of me for that. Uh, it feels very much like it's about COVID and about isolation and about the world coming alive. And he talks about, you know, that he doesn't want that. Like everything can come back alive and he just wants to stay with this person. Um, I did live in California for a while. Rain is weird in California, in Southern California, because like it never happens. And so when it does happen, it feels like it's the <laughs> end of times. Like these frogs come out of nowhere. Seriously, what are the frogs doing in California? It rains like twice. And then it rains and there's like, 10 million frogs, and then it doesn't rain again for another year. What are they doing? Okay, this is like a bad sign. <laughs> What's the deal with California frogs? I regret that more than the Israel-Palestine thing. Uh, but I, I do like it because it, it sort of goes to a sort of larger theme that I've been talking, I talk a lot about on this channel, about the, because, I mean, we live in this world where we're constantly being told to produce, 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 produce. And then we have to remember to be at the same time. Uh, you know, when you're a language teacher, you teach a lot of, about verbs. And irregular verbs are very important to learn because they are the most complicated, because they are the most used, so they're the most irregular. So you often sit there and you'll have these poetic moments of talking about, you know, what is the difference between to have, to be, and to do? And in America in general, we tend, and in most sort of, late stage capitalist societies, we focus on doing and having and very little on being. So anytime you do anything, and I talked about this in my Under 3000 video, anytime you focus on being, it is in and of itself a critique of this capitalist system that we live in. Now, a lot of people got pissed at me for saying that. How can you say that Under 2000 is on a record label? Shut up, dick. <laughs> You can't, you can't beat the system under a rock in the desert, okay? I tried. It doesn't work, okay? All you do is piss off some scorpions. 
so, you know, I think it's important to send this message not to do a single thing. It's part of the anti-work movement and the idea that we can just do nothing. Life Admin, sort of a weak part, uh, the low point of the album. It's a fine track, but it's like talking about speaking to the desert, like going off into the desert, and he talks about his privilege of being able to go off to the desert, and I don't know. Like, I, I don't really relate to it too much. Uh, I do like... The, again, much, much like the first song, the, the notes that I heard were sort of, again, a little more Elvis Costello-y, a little more They Might Be Giants-y. And then I Want to Be Wrong, which... The dark side, oh yeah, is just Bruce Springsteen. I love Bruce Springsteen. I love Bruce Springsteen. He's great. I have tickets to see him in concert. He canceled before because he had an ulcer or something, hemorrhoids. He had some kind of problem. Uh, but this is just, you know, hey, 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 you know, it has that feeling of a great Bruce Springsteen song, uh, uplifting anthem of a pessimist who is not a misanthrope. <laughs> so misanthropy means literally, and you can learn that if you have a, a book of etymology, uh, misanthropy means to hate humanity. Um, the goddamn billionaires have taken the word philanthropy, which means love of humanity, and I would argue that billionaires are all misanthropes because you shouldn't have that much money, but anyways. Um... So, like, to be a pessimist often leads to being a misanthrope because you see things as being dark and the world's going to end and there's going to be trash piles and it's going to be wall -E but not cool. There's not going to be any, like, sexy robots or nothing. It's just going to be bleh, right? So, to be a pessimistic song, I can sense the jaws of hatred have sunk their fangs forevermore. I want to be wrong. So he wants to be wrong about his pessimism because he doesn't want the world to end. A lot of people who are pessimistic and talking about the world ending and talking about how bad things are actually don't like people that much. And so there's a kind of weird glee in their voice. And I like this a lot. I really, really like this song a lot. A uh, nice kind of couple, like there's this, again, there's this great sort of melodic solo that's played on the keyboard. And then there's like a little guitar solo that's just a couple notes. It's very strong. Graveyard song. This is where, you know, especially on the second listen, I'm just grooving. I'm just grooving. Just the guitar is really tight with the drums. I'm just kind of really into this album at this point. Uh, a lot of relatable things being awoken by a notification. Uh, and then we get to this line. And I intentionally have not looked up what does he mean by this. A fuck building bridges. Everybody start digging a graveyard for things that need to die. Is this ironic? or not. Is he describing what is happening to us that we are no longer building bridges, you know, connecting people? That what we really need to do is dig graves. And so is it like a negative song? Or is it saying, you know, let the past die, kill it if you have to? Kylo Ren. You know, like is that what he's saying? I don't know. But I can tell you one thing, it's almost Christmas. There's some jingle bells on this song. I know the album came out in September, <laughs> but but I'm listening to it in December. So this is a Christmas album. Much like Die Hard 2. It's a movie all about uh, Kwanzaa. So the, the last verse has this great like high, high rise, like ringing note, just one line. And you know, watching the world burst for no good reason. And I think that's fundamentally where he is. Again, the concept that the external forces can bring the internal down. The album ends with Three Summers, more kind of bratty singing, great melody, beautiful opening verse. And then this is about the other problem with the modern state, okay? So, um, I know it's not okay, but I still participate. And in this case, he's talking about flying to Europe, right? Because it's, it's immoral to fly to Europe. And this is just where we get to the, what can I possibly do? Like, what, like, what, like, what can I possibly do? You know, who made this shirt, right? Nice, nice green shirt. Got it at a... <sighs> Banana Republic, probably. So whatever, probably a Pakistani child made this made this shirt. Who made this phone that's recording this? <laughs> you know? Like, what ads have popped up? Have you seen an ad for PragerU on this ad? Uh, someone told me that happened to them once. <laughs> you know? 
what, what can we do, right? And that's the problem is we're all implicated. The only thing we could possibly hope to do is become that person who's waging revolution under a rock, pissing off some scorpions. Like that's the only thing you can really do is cut yourself off from society, in which case you can't do anything. And then he says this next line, going back to video games, how long can you defend against a cheat code? He appears to be talking about the systematic inequality in life. And this is that thing. This is that thing. Sometimes people criticize me for, for um, accepting the term white guilt as being potentially an acceptable thing. I don't think white guilt in term, like in the way that most people use it is very useful, but I do think it is very important to remember the cheat codes that we all live with, right? And that's another way of saying privileges, but it's true. It, it's a cheat code. You know, I'm making these great videos and I'm smart enough to talk about prolix and talk about this, but I had a lot of help by things that were completely out of my control. And that doesn't mean I don't deserve any credit for the choices that I've made to be here. You know, I mean, <laughs> um, back when I related the song Doubt, I did not see this in my future. You know, I mean, you still have to work hard even with the cheat codes, but you got a cheat code. You have a cheat code for you and a lot of people have cheat codes against them. I know it's not okay, but I still participate. That's a great middle age lyric <laughs> because that's the point you get into where when you're young, you think you can change the world and then you get to be a certain age and you realize, well, you can change the world. You know, you can vote for politicians who will hopefully do something better than not. And you say, oh, what's the difference between them? I don't know. Is abortion legal? You idiot. Of course there's a big difference. Okay. Yes, there's a difference. Always vote, right? But but beyond that, you realize that all you can really do is control the people around you, control like control how you treat people around you, heal yourself, be good to your children, raise good children, have a good community, try to be a human in a world that's increasingly inhuman, and make great art, or in my case, hopefully share thoughts about great art that might lead to the world being a better place, which in the long arc of history will hopefully bend towards justice. I know that sounds like I'm being like a, like a centrist do-nothing, but I don't know. As it, uh, an eternity lapsed as I swallowed attacks and just held them in, uh, I can't be fixed, I'm just, so I'm just aching, because the longer I go, the more that I know that I'm different than I am before, and you can't help me anymore, ooh anymore anymore it just goes this great punk outro it has a beautiful fade out has the sense that it's going on to eternity so there's there's my review of this album i unfortunately put all my patreons underneath the camera so the camera's gonna go wee oh, wait, these aren't all my patreons where are the rest of my patreons there you go so did, did you like this album you know did, did you write prolix in the comments <laughs> Did you know that word before? It's a good word. I can't believe I forgot if it meant the thing that it means or the complete opposite. Because uh, that's pretty goofy. But that's the thing, you know. You gotta, you, gotta know, you gotta admit when you don't know something, you know. So anyways, these are... Oh, now it's saying I'm almost out of batteries. All right, well, I'm gonna go off and uh, finish grading in this semester. If you're in college, uh, I'm gonna do this at the end of every video and you're having trouble Talk to your professors. They care about how you're doing. Don't keep it to yourself, okay? Love yourself. <laughs> There's the camera.